reading. The second reading is from Acts, the tenth chapter. In Caesarea, a man named Cornelius was a centurion in the Italian regiment. He and all of his family were devout and God fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. At three o'clock one afternoon, he had a vision. An angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared in fear and asked, What is it, Lord? The angel replied, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before the Lord God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner by the sea. When the angel left, Cornelius called two servants and a devout soldier. And he told them everything that happened. And he sent them to Joppa. Um, I like to start with something relatively funny. This um, longtime doctor brought in a new guy to help out. And um, one day, 63-year-old patient named Miss Johnson just left in a huff and a hurry. The older doctor checked on her and he went into the new fellow and he said, Did you just tell Miss Johnson that she's pregnant? He said, Yes. He said, she's 63 years old. She's got four grown children and six grandchildren. She's not pregnant. He said, I know, but she doesn't have the hiccups anymore. (laughs) I don't mean to scare you, but I think we're pregnant. I honestly believe that God is doing something new here now. There was an Arizona man heading off to his retirement in a, a nursing home. And he found an L.A. Lakers memorabilia poster signed. So he called in an expert and he said, yeah, this thing's worth $300. But what's that crazy painting over there? It's got all these swirls and splatters of color. It looks like a kid drew it. Well, the appraiser took it to his office and for three months he asked around and to find out what it might be. And he discovered that this man, Gordon, had a half-sister named Jennifer with one N. She was the black sheep of the family. She left the Midwest and went to New York City to hobnob and rub shoulders with socialites and artists. Well, Jennifer died in 1990. And so her brother packed up all of her stuff and put it in his garage until January 2016. After 18 months of searching, the appraiser has spent $50,000 hiring a private investigator, chasing down rabbit holes, pouring hours over every letter that young lady had written in her life. And she finally, he finally found out that she knew the famous artist Jackson Pollock. Well, when he had that proof, the experts would finally consider looking at the painting. And they appraised it, but they said it is so heavily damaged. It needed so much restoration after years of being in a house with a heavy smoker and many more years in a hot Arizona garage. So the appraiser spent 50000 more to fix it. It went on the auction block last year for 10 to 15 million dollars. I want to tell you that God has people out there that are stuck in boxes who may look worthless and damaged, but they are priceless. And if some church, if some Christian would take them in and take the time to get to know them and clean them up and help them get appraised, you know, it helps when we shine people up by praising them. But you know, It does not matter what people say about us. That does not change our worth. Your value is not even, and their value, is not even based on what we do or where we live. Your value is based on who painted you. And you are a masterpiece by God. He said in the Bible, I chose you, you're my masterpiece, and you're my special possession. That's a free favor. That's a gift of grace. That's a done deal. And that's all the alliteration I could come up with that one sentence. Sorry. In 1 Peter, Peter, the guy um, that Cornelius went to fetch to get, said, You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's special, peculiar possession. Appointed so you can declare the praises of the God who brought you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. My favorite psalm, and you should learn this psalm and say it every day, is Psalm 27. It's the best book of the whole Bible. And one line, it has everything. In one line, he says, if my mom and dad, no, it says, when my mother and father abandon me, the Lord will take me in. 
Maybe you're the black sheep of the family. Or maybe you have a spouse or family or friends or a boss that you could just never be good enough for. The tragedy in life is that some people are still trying to get those folks approval. And I'm going to tell you, you never will. If they didn't like you, they're probably not going to like you. And that's okay. Because it's their loss and you are worth $10 million. If you have 10% of that in a tithe, I would accept it right now during the offering time. The good news is you don't need people that don't need you. There are two billion Christians on the planet and you have already been accepted as a member of God's family. You have brothers and sisters, moms all over the world. Jeremiah said this at the very beginning of his the longest career in prophecy. He said, the Lord told me before I formed you in the womb, I already knew you. God knew you were coming. I call this sermon the pregnant pastor because I really sense that God is at work in this house, in your lives. I've felt that way since the moment I first walked in this door. The prophet Haggai, and Haggai, I don't know if you said that right. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong or don't. Just sort of nod. Does anybody know how to pronounce that name? Haggai, Haggai? He said the glory of this present house is going to be more than the glory of this house in the past. Thus says the Lord Almighty, because here I will grant you peace. What God did for our parents, what God did for our grandparents, he is going to do more for you in the next 20, 30 years. I can't tell you how many people from how many churches around this county come to me and they say, David, I'm so worried about our little congregation. In 10 years, I don't know what's going to happen. What will happen when we die? Well, when you die, you'll go to heaven. It'll be somebody else's problem. So stop worrying about it. The blessing and the favor of the past generations was good, but we serve a God of greater. We serve a God who has better things in store for you. And Cornelius found that out. He could have said, I've reached the top of my career. I've got everything going for me. Everybody loves me. But it wasn't enough. God wanted to give him more. He thought he had put his ladder up against the best building and climbed to the top. And God said, nope, I'm going to lean it against this other building, against Jesus. And you're going to have more goodness than you can ever imagine. We worry so much about maintaining what others have built. But God knows how to build even bigger and move more than they ever thought possible. So today I'm trying to get you to get your hopes up. Enlarge your vision like Cornelius. Because we are expecting God to do something. Do you see how clever way that I pause? Like we're expecting. So the Bible said today, go out and enlarge your tent. Stretch out your curtains, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. God is about to bring more people into your life, into this church, into your families, and more blessings to you. Now that may sound scary, but today in the reading, God said, do not be afraid. It may sound impossible, but God said, you will not be put to shame. God is doing something at first Presbyterian, but how is that possible? Let me tell you. Jesus, according to the Bible, is the husband of the church. The church is called the bride of Christ, and Jesus is the one that can raise the dead, so I'm pretty sure he can do anything he wants to. Over in Europe last month, they found the oldest living tree, 1,230 years old, 1230. It's called a Heldrick pine, and I'm going to say that like I know what a Heldrick pine is. And the thing they found about this oldest tree in Europe is it's still growing. And it's recently had a growth spurt. So we need to make room for this new baby. We need to add on. The Hampshire Colony, we're going to vote next week on adding a bathroom. I have never seen people so happy than the discussion of having a bathroom next to the sanctuary. The Bible said today, burst into song and shout for joy. And if it was about having a bathroom, I can understand that. But you know that shouting for joy and having bursting of the songs may be about making a baby. Maybe we're going to do the rhythm method. No, that's bad. It's a bad joke, sorry. We're going to do the, we're going to do the Cornelius method because we learn the scripture. What's the Cornelius method? Cornelius, I didn't say I was a good preacher, Jamie. Don't just, you can just roll your eyes all you want to on the front row. I can still see it. The Cornelius method was a, we saw a person doing their job. He was a centurion, which means he took care of 100 soldiers. 
And you took care of servants. You, you take care for your servants. How many of you had servants? Oh, you've got to get servants. This is the best. I have a young lady named Sarah Smith who cleans my house. She came in, and my house isn't dirty. I'm a neat guy. And she said, well, David, I can do more. And I said, I don't need more. I said, well, I bought this table in a box at Walmart on sale. You could help me. You know, I'm a man. I can do it myself but if you really want. Well, three days later, no, no, about three hours later, after we called her husband in and all of her kids and the whole family was in my house, we finally figured out how to do it with me supervising and them uh, actually figuring. I don't think those screws really lined up exactly right. You have staff. How many of you have ever gone to a restaurant and had somebody wait on you? To a bank and had a teller. To a store and had a clerk. All of the, And we serve other people too. It's not one way. We need to treat everybody as our servants and also as the people we serve. He was good to his family, to his friends he loved. He was generous to his neighbors. Cornelius' method is a person who is faithful to God. Scripture said his whole family was devout. He was a generous giver. And he was faithful in regular prayer. And he was a person that operated on God's timetable. Remember it said about 3 o'clock? Well, I should know this because I'm a pastor, but I typed it into the Google. 3 o'clock. And it popped up. Does anybody know what happened at 3 o'clock? That's when Jesus died. you think I would have thought of that. At 3 o'clock when Jesus lost everything. And there's a lot of us here that are going through problems, right? We've, we've lost people we love. We've been betrayed by people. We have illnesses and financial challenges. We have feelings inside we don't know how to manage. We've got all of these issues. And Jesus is sitting there hanging on a cross, suffering every single loss that we have possibly suffered for us. And it didn't turn out well. He died. And I think God strategically chose that hour to visit Cornelius. Because he wanted to know, Cornelius, are you on your time schedule? And you want things the way you want them? Or are you open to the way I envision the future? And Cornelius grabbed a hold of God's vision. And so I want to ask you, what is God saying to you right now? And Cornelius' response was like us. He stared in absolute fear. He was scared witless. This big, strong, successful soldier man who had traveled half the known world, fought wars, and, 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 and trained men was afraid. But he had his priorities straight, and he said, Lord. Um, you know that bank next to Spoons, that beautiful stone bank? Uh, I used to have a small investment insurance business, and I had my business in a bank like that. I, I just, it's so, the cavernous, it's so big and beautiful. And my favorite thing about financial planning was talking to people, learning their stories, getting to know their hopes and dreams, and then looking over you know, their goals and coming up with a plan. I have, in my opinion, I think you can tell more about people. No matter what airs they put on or what they say, you can tell so much about a person by looking at their priorities in three places. Look at their calendar, look at their checkbook, and look at their cell phone. And that's pretty much all you need to know about people. Tommy Rose, the um, radio guy over at 88.3, our Christian station in town, sent me a video this week of a pastor named John Maxwell. And he doesn't pastor anymore. Now he teaches CEOs around the world how to be great leaders. And John Maxwell said that he was having lunch with this big CEO, one of the top 50 companies in America. And they had a great time together. And the guy's being polite. He wasn't really a polite guy. He certainly wasn't a Christian. He had some rough edges. He was, he was definitely a Jackson Pollock in the garage kind of guy. And he said, well, tell me about your faith. You're a pastor. And John said, no, you can't handle my faith. He said, well, that's an odd response. So they got together and played golf sometime. And, you know, while they're out, they said, well, tell me a little bit about your faith. How do you, you know, see God and stuff? He said, no, I'm not going to tell you about my faith. He said, what do you mean you're not going to tell me about your faith? He said, you aren't ready to hear about my faith. You can't handle my faith. Here's what's going to happen, Mr. CEO. I'm going to be friends with you. We're going to go to lunch. We're going to play golf. And I'm going to help you be the best CEO you have ever been. And when you get to the point where you are begging for me to tell you about my faith... That's when I might tell you about my faith. Go ahead and take your golf shot. And that went on and on until they got to be really good friends. And one day he got this look in his eye and the CEO turned to John and he said, John, I really, I really think I am ready to hear about your faith. And John said, you almost are. And he said, would you come to my house and talk to me and my wife? 
He went there that night and they had the most beautiful conversation. And that man and his wife gave their hearts to Jesus and invited Jesus to become the Lord of their lives. And a month later, John saw him for lunch or something and he was the happiest he had ever seen him. He said, what has happened to you? He said, I did it. You did what? <laughs> he said, last night I told my board of directors that I made God the Lord of my life and it is the best decision I've ever made. Cornelius was a person who shared his vision with others. The Bible says when the angel left, he didn't jump the gun. Have you ever been in the middle of a conversation and somebody cuts you off? I do this to people all the time. FYI, they don't like it. I know what you're going to say. Now shut up so I can answer you and tell you why you're wrong. Don't do that. He didn't jump the gun. He waited for the angel to finish and leave. And then he didn't do something. He didn't talk himself out of it. My goodness, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. There's no way I can do that. Why do I want to go to Joppa? Why do I want to go to a guy named Simon? I don't know. Instead, he called friends and told them everything. Now, I know you're telling me, David, we heard the scripture. He did not say friends. He said he called two servants. Would you being experts know that that is a translation of the word slave and a devout soldier who worked for him? It would get killed if he didn't do what he was told. So you're saying he's not a friend, but listen to this. Jesus said, you call me Lord. And that's right, because that's who I am. But I call you my friends because I tell you everything I know. You know, in life, everybody talks, but very few people communicate. Um, I'm a guy, so when I buy a present, I'll go to Macy's or something, I'll buy something. They put it in a bag, which to me looks like wrapping paper. You give it to someone, it's pre-wrapped, you say here, and guess where it's from. But a man with more style, or most ladies, would tell me, no, you've got to decorate. You've got to, the presentation is important. You've got to wrap a ribbon around it, do that little twirly thing at the top, make a bow, and present it. And that's when people will receive what you're giving. And you've got to do that with our communication. You've got to put a bow on it, B-O-W. You've got to be bold, you've got to be open, and you've got to be wise. They asked Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul, how can we pray for you? He said, pray that I will be bold to speak the words. Paul asked for boldness. That was the boldest man I've ever heard of. You have to be open. Cornelius told it all. You have to be wise. He chose a devout soldier. Jesus said, don't just throw your holy stuff before every dog. Because the dog may trample what's most sacred to you and then turn on you. So let me ask you this. Who is going to get all of this done? I'm already two minutes over the time that I set, so this is not looking good for your hero here. Um, the radio will only play 30 minutes of my sermon, and I don't know how I can put the two together. All right. Well, who's going to get it done? You are. We read that scripture from Peter, and he said, you are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood. Every member of God's family is a minister. And a priest does two things, right? Goes directly to God. You don't need anybody to go there for you. And then shares and takes cares God and takes care of God's people, right? That's your job. We get to do this, um, the Bible said, to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. I like to say praise equals pray plus, plus say. I'm going to drink some water. Maybe I should just quit while I'm ahead. If you say pray and say, pray, say, pray, say, praise, it sounds like praise. So that's our job. It's just to pray and then tell people about it. And praise God. So, let's see what happens next. Would you please join me in speaking out loud what God did for us in the reading printed in our bulletins?